All right, Revelation chapter 20, we're going to look at three verses today, verses 1 through 3. And I'm just going to go ahead and read that. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. All right. I don't like that last line. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be all right because Jesus is going to deal with them once and for all. Then. Um, this is one of those uh, passages of scripture where we'll. No, not everybody agrees on how to interpret what it means, especially when you get to the thousand years part. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but the judgment of Satan, that's what we've been talking about. Uh, this is kind of, we've kind of broken it up a little bit, but when you're reading it back to back here, it's, it's one thing happening after another. But you see the judgment of Satan happening in two stages. First, you'll see his temporary imprisonment in the bottomless pit, or your translation may call it the abyss. And then, after that, it's going to be, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire, which is his eternal punishment. All right? So, in verse 1, he says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Uh, anytime John uses it in the book of Revelation, then I saw, you can, you can almost guarantee that's a transition he's seeing another vision. The, the vision has changed, and so he's, that's how he, how he uh, announces that. So it doesn't, though, when you see that, does not mean that he's seeing these in chronological order. So what are we to make of that? I don't know. <laughs> and we're going to leave it right there. <laughs> so he uses time terms when he was wanting to indicate chronological sequence. And we see this, and we see this right here in this passage, words like until after that and when so that tells chronology but we don't know how these scenes all fit together and it's going to be exciting when it all unfolds and we actually see what this is all about so what is striking at first glance is that god delegates the imprisonment of satan to an anonymous angel you know why why does he do this i have my theory it could be wrong but this is how uh, fitting Satan's punishment is, that God just sends an angel to go put him in prison. Uh, this, this being, this creature, this spirit who thought he was greater than God is now being escorted to prison by just an angel. All right? Uh, that, that's at least my theory of why God's doing that. <clears throat> Remember, Satan is not God's opposite. He is his opponent, but he's not his opposite. And God will not treat him as his direct opposite. God simply tells an angel to take care of it. And this angel holds what? Keys to the bottomless keys. pit. Keys to the bottomless pit. The keys to the abyss. Literally, that, <coughs> that word means without depth. Okay, so it's bottomless, right? That's, that's kind of what it means. And it's a term that's used seven times in Revelation. And every time that term is used, it's talking about the place of, you know, temporary holding uh, a prison if you will for demonic spirits all right speaking of keys there's four keys mentioned in the book of revelation three of them are used as far as locking up you know in a negative sense one of them is a very positive term the first one we saw was in chapter 1 verse 18 where it says that jesus holds the keys of hades and death that means he has the authority over it. Obviously, he came back from, from the dead. You know, he, he defeated death. He holds the keys over it. The second key we see is in chapter 3, verse 7. That's the key of David. And Jesus holds that key too. And that's a positive key. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1, the third key is the key to the shaft of the abyss. Now, what is the difference between the shaft of the abyss and the keys to the abyss? I don't know. Maybe it's the same key. But it's listed there uh, in chapter 9. And then here in chapter 20, of course, we see the key to the abyss. God is sovereign. God is sovereign over all. 
and that includes Satan. He is completely so sovereign over Satan and his entire demonic army. So this angel stands ready to escort, and not only that, but it says he has what else? Chains. A chain. And how is this chain described? Heavy. A heavy or a great chain, right? So he's standing ready. He's going to harness this dragon. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Think about when you're going to lead a vicious animal like a dog, and you need to do that safely. You're going to put a muzzle on it, right? Well, the picture is, is God is now putting a muzzle on Satan, and he's leading them away, this great chain to confine him into the prison. Now, in verse 2, we see the names for Satan that have been used so far throughout Revelation. They're all pulled together in one string of, of terms here. So we have dragon, we have ancient serpent, we have the devil, and then we just have we just see the transliteration Satan there, right? So as the dragon, Satan was defeated. We saw this in chapter 12. Satan was defeated by the archangel Michael in the heavenly war. Okay? Now he's also explicitly identified as the ancient serpent of Genesis 3. I remember talking about Genesis 3 one time, and someone raised their hand. They said, well, how do you know that that's the devil? It never really says it's the devil. I said, well, go to Revelation. It makes it real clear for us who is behind that. So now he's explicitly identified as Satan, right? He's the ancient serpent who tempted Adam and Eve and who tried to destroy the Messianic community, Israel. Lastly here, it says that he's the devil or Satan which means adversary or accuser. And that's, that's what he does. He accuses. Um, he knows that his time is short. He knows that his time and his, his authority, his power, is very limited. And so what does he devote his time and his effort to doing? Ruining as many as he can and why can he? Yeah, ruining and destroying and lying. And that's what he's doing. He's attacking the people of God. And it says here that Satan is then in prison for how long? A thousand years. A thousand years. What are we supposed to make of a thousand years? And we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that. Notice that it's uh, typically when we see numbers, especially in, in the book of Revelation, when they're nice round numbers, they're symbolic. So I tend to think of this as a symbolic number, right? When it's more specific, we see reasons for that. So is this a literal 1,000 years? Is this a symbolic time period? Um, it is if you take 10 and cube it, 10 times 10 times 10. We've seen similar things happen throughout Revelation like that. You get 1,000. So 10, we've seen, stands for... It's a number of completion. It's been used that way. And here it's being cubed. And so it's an undeterminate period of time. That's one interpretation. It comes from the Latin mille, which means a thousand. And annus, which means year. And so you have the word millennium. How many of you ever heard the word millennium? A thousand years. And then some terms go with that. We'll get into that in just a minute about how people have understood how to, how to take this 1,000 years. But let's look at verse 3 real quick. It says, The angel threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the 1,000 years were ended. Notice here that Satan is completely powerless to fight against this angel. He's completely arrested. Uh, so to speak. Notice the string of forceful verbs that's used here to highlight his imprisonment. It's one after another. He was seized, he was bound, he was thrown, he was shut, and then he was sealed. So uh, powerful verbs being used one after another. All right, so let's talk about millennialism. Yep, there's three main interpretations about how to accept or how to understand the thousand years. How many of you have ever heard of premillennialism or premillennials? All right. How many of you have heard of an amillennialist? How about a postmillennialist? All right. Uh, I've known all three. All right. I'm just going to say straight up uh, before we even start talking, I'm a premillennialist. Okay. That's just where I fall. My, the best understanding that as I read the Bible, 
that makes the most sense. I, I'm not saying that it doesn't have its problems because each system has an issue, it has a problem, but that's the closest that I can see. So what is premillennialism? That means that Christ is going to return to earth physically. He's going to destroy the forces of evil. And he's going to reign with his people for an indefinite period of time represented by the number of 1,000. And this time will be followed by Satan's ultimate defeat, the final judgment, and then a new heaven and a new earth will be ushered in. Okay, that's, that's in a nutshell what premillennialists believe. And if you read just a straightforward reading of Revelation, that's the conclusion you come to. That's what you see. Uh, now, premillennialists have their own divisions in their own groups. There's historic premillennialists. There's progressive premillennialists. And you start saying premillennialism a bunch of times, it starts sounding real funny. Um, and within this dispensational premillennialism, there's classic and there's progressive in that. So it just keeps dividing. Uh, it's kind of like a hydra. You cut off one head and another one, another two grow back. All right, so that's premillennialism. Amillennialism means there's no 1,000 year reign. Okay, so here's what they say in a nutshell. They don't believe that there will be a visible, earthly return of Christ. And it either symbolizes the heavenly, the thousand years symbolizes the heavenly reign of Christ with Christians who have already died, as in they're already there and Christ is with them in heaven, or the present spiritual reign of Christ in the lives of believers right here on earth. So it's a, it's, they're taking it in a completely spiritual sense. Um, Satan is currently bound by the gospel of Christ. That, that doesn't make any sense to me how they got that. And when Christ returns, there'll be a resurrection of all people for final judgment, followed by the eternal state that Christ is going to transform us to in, in when we get to heaven. That's all millennialist. Now, you would think, who in the world would be an amillennialist? But there's a bunch of them out there. I just can't accept it. I just can't go along with it. All right, post-millennialist. They say that the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, will be a period of peace and righteousness on earth brought about by the progress of the gospel and the work of God's people. So because the gospel is being preached and because Christians are doing a lot of good things, it's going to usher in the thousand-year uh, reign or the thousand-year peace of Christ. And after the spiritual reign of Christ, he will return to raise the dead, judge humans, and usher in the eternal kingdom. Now, when we started this study, and we, I mentioned these terms. I said every single one of these have problems. But two of them have more problems than the other one. Okay, so that's why I'm a pre-millennialist, because it's more of a straightforward reading of the text. And the text here points to a complete and total binding of Satan. Okay? And they throw him into the prison at the end of the age. So that pre teaches that. That's what's going to happen. Rather than, here's what the, the amillennial is saying, Satan is just curtailed in his activities. He's just limited and, uh, during the present age. And the text also supports the absence of deception. When it says that he's thrown in the prison, it says that he cannot deceive anymore. It's not just that he's limited. It means he's, there is no deception anymore. Can y'all just imagine for a second what that's like when complete deception is removed from the earth? Um, we, can't, we can't really imagine. Now, while the first coming of Christ certainly dealt a death blow to Satan, I mean, that was the victory, right? When he came and he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, uh, that, that struck at Satan. And we, we have some scriptures that go along with that. John 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Okay, so Jesus said those words. And he said now, as in, this is the next thing that's going to happen. In other words, we talked about from the time Jesus was resurrected and went back up into heaven to the current day that we, you know, whatever this date is today, 23rd, I should know that. Should know I should know that. that. Isabella's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the last days. 
you know, the church has always been in the last days. So Christ says he's now going. This is going to happen. This is going to happen real soon. And so we see that he he talking about that with his disciples early on. And then Colossians two fifteen. Here's Colossians. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So the 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 battle, so to speak, has been won. The victory is Jesus's. However, we're seeing the rest play out over time. So even though Christ uh, dealt that death blow to Satan, the New Testament also makes clear that in the meantime, Satan continues to do destructive things, right? He's a wounded animal, so to speak. He's very dangerous in that sense. And he's doing damage during this present age. So 2 Corinthians 4 Three through four. I've got it. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, <coughs> who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Okay. Who is the God of this age? Satan. Satan. It says that he's blinded their eyes you ever wonder how can people just not get the gospel it's because they're blinded to it and god hasn't opened their eyes and that's why we have to keep praying for people ephesians 2 1 and 2 and you were dead in the trans trespass trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Okay, so I was talking about Satan here again. Mm -hmm. Prince of the power of the air. And he's doing what? He's leading people astray. He's leading people off the right path that God has for us. All right, how about 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26? I have that. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So, so one of the reasons why we have pastors and teachers and Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, is that they will help us understand what the truth is so that we can avoid what? The trap of the devil. So we have to help each other avoid the trap of the devil. And so that just means he's actively trying to trap people. And then 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil has a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Okay. Just a warning for us. He's out there and he's trying to destroy. He's trying to devour people. So we, we see here in chapter 20 though, in Revelation, Satan's going to be put on total lockdown. That means that roaring lion that's going around seeking who he can destroy, that's going to stop. Jesus is going to put a stop to it. And so he's going to be on total lockdown with no possibility of escape. He can't get out. That's why it talks about the great chain. He's going to be thrown into the abyss. He can't get out until God lets him out. The purpose of Satan's imprison, imprisonment is to prevent him from deceiving the nations. And it says here, for a time. Okay. What are we to make of all this, though? What exactly is being communicated? What about the nations? Could... That could refer to the unbelievers who weren't part of the rest who were killed and destroyed when we talked about the fall of Babylon. Um, more likely than that, the rest uh, who were killed but later were pulled back from the dead to be deceived by Satan. Remember what we talked about Satan being a great uh, uh, trickster? You know, he, he wants to imitate what Christ has done. He tries to deceive people by doing that. And I think we're going to keep seeing that until he's finally put uh, into the lake of fire. Now, the word nations here 
we see in chapter 19, verse 21, uh, I'll read that real quick. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So those people were definitely put to death, right? And they, they became food for the birds. In chapter 20, verse 5, which we didn't read tonight, but we'll get to it. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So the rest... These people who have died and been uh, caught up in the judgment, now it says they're going to come back from the dead. You know, as many times as I've read Revelation, that's one of the details that it seems to just, I've skipped over. And I've missed that little part. And then in chapter 20, verse 8, uh, he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. So, maybe there's a lot to the idea of a zombie than we realize. So these people are coming back from the dead. Were they the unbelievers? Unbelievers, yes. Those who rebelled against Christ. During the thousand year reign of Christ, during the millennium, where are they? They are in the place of the dead with Satan. Okay? So Satan is in this abyss and that's, that's where they'll all be. The text here simply says that Satan will not deceive. He won't be able to deceive until the thousand-year reign of Christ is over. <clears throat> and after that, he'll be set free for a time to deceive again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe this is what you're saying. I'm not understanding. Yeah. But there's got to be people here because if he can't deceive if there's nobody here. To right. Deceive. That's the question, isn't it? Who is he deceiving? Yeah. yeah who's left? There's got to be more people left than th that are just simply talked about uh, here. Unless the, the rest are those who have come back out of the abyss with Satan. So there's two ways of looking at it. And I don't know what the real answer is. So we're going to have to wait and see. Because <laughs> I don't know anybody else that has the answer either. <laughs> Alright, any questions? It is deep. Yeah. This is this is even though it was just three verses, I was I didn't know what to do with this because there's so much uh, difference of opinions that people have uh, when it comes to the millennium. How long will Satan move after the thousand years from Satan's loose? No, no. Yes, in that last line is what Bob was reading. After a thousand years, right? So he had to lose again. But then, we're but then he's just gonna. Then it's the great white throne judgment, and Satan will be judged forever. Yeah, is that an opportunity for people to get saved during this? That's what we don't really know. Or? I don't think so. I think one of one of the things I read when I was studying about this is it's one guy's idea: why does why does Christ imprison Satan? for a, whatever period of time and then let him out again so he can deceive. Well, it's making the point that even even though people can talk, definitely see the influence of Satan and the difference when he's removed, they're still going to choose to go against Christ even though they just went through this whole period of... Do we know is the Holy Spirit present during that period? I'm just asking... He dwells with believers. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> he can go where he wants. <laughs> Good question, sir. But, you know, if it's going to be a time of Christ reigning for mm -hmm. a thousand years, and what do and we as humans do? Do we become complacent? And, you know, that could be... Mm -hmm. Now people get deceived at that point. Right. And that, you know, you, you've had a long period of time, you know, where things have gone well and are really, really good, and you just kind of right. coast along. That's right. That's rather right. Rather than keep working as he's told us to do. Mm -hmm. So during that thousand years, there won't be any sin because the devil's locked up. Well, we can sin without the devil. That's what I thought. <laughs> there just won't be any deception. There won't be any, he won't be actively deceiving anybody. Yeah. 
which is a complete witness for Christ. Well, we well, God, God, Satan didn't even exist. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting deep. <laughs> I'm going to let Caleb answer that. Next <laughs> <time>. <laughs> you can continue. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Break him in good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and he had to see all this coming. <laughs> and he still created them. Yeah. Yeah. Just like he saw us sinning, and he still created us. Right. Yeah. You know, I say if there are still people that are unbelievers here, and when he's released again, he'll definitely have people that he can see. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. He's going to practice because the house can be good. <laughs> Why he's locked up? It won't do him any good, though, because it's, it's over once he lets them back out. Yeah. No more deceiving. Right. That's when Christ judges on the great white throne judgment. And then the, we start to see the new heavens and new earth and the reversal of the curse. So, you know, what you see in the end of Revelation is a complete reversal of what happened in the Garden of Eden. When sin entered in the world and all the consequences, God is putting Eden back together. And sin will be gone. That's right. No more sin. Right. Perfection. Any other questions? I just like that. Last that I can't thing. answer. I like that. <laughs> Literally reversing what happened in the Garden of Eden to where we go back to the Garden. That's right. In essence. That's right. And I really appreciate you saying that you really don't understand because it helps me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it helps me feel I don't understand it. If you don't understand it, then. <laughs> we're in good company. Yeah, we're not too bad off. Yeah, but the, the main the main thing we can take away from this is be careful. Be careful what you read, what you listen to, because Satan works in different ways, and he can use people in your life to deceive you too. So don't get up, get, don't get caught up in theological arguments that, that really don't matter at all. Because a lot of people do that. Just, just walk away from it. Because uh, it doesn't matter. You know, my dad has a saying, and I find it true, the biggest lie is in your truth. Because it's, oh, yeah. it's just one little thing. And you go, everything seems right. But if you're not grounded in this, you miss that one little thing that's off. And that can gradually end up changing things significantly. That's right. That's right. Yeah, one little degree turn can veer your course way off. <laughs>